My Egypt 360, are we back where we started? Uh, I've been covering the Egyptian story for three years, for as long as it's been at the forefront of the news for the BBC, and more often than not, uh, even though I try to provide answers, many, many questions come back, and more recently, people come up to me from the newsroom or outside and say, what is wrong with your country? What is going on? But more often than not, they ask me this question, are you guys just back where you started? Didn't it happen the other way around? Is it a full circle now? And so I thought I would attempt to answer this question with you guys. But before we start, there are a couple of things I want to mention. One is the 2011 revolution in Egypt was a milestone in so many ways. One is that it tilted the balance of what we now know as the Arab Spring or the Arab up Uprising. It was no longer just about the country that preceded it, which was Tunisia. When Egypt got involved, when people of Egypt took to the streets, it was about one of the biggest countries in the region, one of the most influential countries of the region, becoming part of this momentum now. Libya soon followed, Yemen, Syria, and there's so much to be said about where these countries have ended up now. But the fact is, it happened. The fact is, people in those countries took to the streets, found enough courage to challenge the leadership for a very long time in the history of this region. This talk really is about a personal take. I'm originally Egyptian, and covering this story, I found time and time again that I was tested not only on how to tell the story to a worldwide audience, but also how to detach myself from the story sometimes, how to let it affect me sometimes, and how to completely isolate myself from what was going on around me on a personal level. By no means at all is this a chronicling of every single event that happened in the last three years. We'd be here all night, and it's just not. We, we won't have enough time. So it's basically just key moments. The first one was January 25th, very, very beginning. It was a Tuesday, I remember, and I had a late producer's shift, and my, my, my editor said, look, there's an Egypt story, people are taken to the streets, find out what's happening in Cairo, see what the correspondent there is going to send us, and let us know how we can tell the story. And to me, I just thought, oh, these guys are just gonna get hammered, aren't they? They're just gonna get dispersed, some of them are gonna get arrested, and then we're gonna call it a day. And I had no idea that I was actually witnessing history being made in my country, my country changing as we know it, and that I was going to be part of telling that story. Now, one of the theme tunes of Tahrir Square was Erhal, and this was symbolic in so many ways. People in Egypt who grew up under Mubarak will tell you that they wouldn't have dreamt of this picture, Mubarak's poster with a big cross on it, and people saying, leave. The the yellow Arabic word is dhalim, it's the Arabic for oppressor. And again, no one would have expected this to happen in Egypt. One of the difficulties of telling the story was telling the story from a distance. In the 18 days when this happened, I was in the World TV and World Service newsroom, trying to make sense of it all, trying to digest it all, um, but also watching streets and people that I recognized very well in a completely different context. And so it was really, really difficult to try and make sense of the story as it was happening very, 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 very quickly, uh, tell it to my colleagues, but also most importantly, tell it to the audience. There were so many stories about conflict with the police, so many fights with the police, so many clashes, many, many people died, but at one point the police forces retreated, and that was one of the surprises of this revolution, because back in the day the police ruled the streets, they were the bosses, and no one could defy them. The fact that they left the streets was quite an event. But they left the streets to thugs, they left it to chaos, they left it to more violence. Many, many reports about looting, killing, my friends telling me that they frantically would go to the supermarket to stock up on water and food and milk for their children, only to find that the supermarket was looted and burned to flames. They would go to the ATM machine to get some money, only to find that the ATM machine was vandalized. And so the army took to the streets. The army was the only institution that could protect the streets, protect the people. And then this picture happened. Tanks on the streets, armored vehicles, and to me, 
my home country then became different. It became a battleground. Cairo was no longer Cairo. Alexandria was no longer Alexandria. They were war zones. And I was, as I was watching all of this, trying again to make sense of it all, putting pictures together, because this is a news, it's a, it's a 24 hour news machine, and they want pieces, and they want voices, and they want you know, reports from Cairo, Shaima, what's the latest, who can you get us? So there's a whole practical side going on, and so I was focused on trying to get pieces together to keep up with the events. And I remember one day one of my colleagues, I was sitting in the newsroom, came up to me and said, what's it like? You're watching all of this. This is, this is your hometown. This is, this is home. What's it like watching all of this? And I remember shrugging my shoulder and saying, well, it's news, isn't it? And I remember it as if it was yesterday. I ran very, very quickly to the bathroom, and I cried uncontrollably for what seemed like ages. And it dawned on me that the personal and the professional will have to coexist at some point, and that I had to control how it affected me, what would affect me. And I agreed with myself that when I step into the newsroom, I was going to try and detach myself as much as I could. And I was only going to provide personal insight if it helped the story. But I also allowed myself some breakdown time when I went home just to be able to manage what was going on. Now, throughout these 18 days, as I said, events unfolded really, really quickly. And of course, this there was the day when Mubarak stepped down. And again, from a distance, I watched in absolute amazement. People who grew up in Egypt at that time will tell you that it's ingrained in us that Mubarak was the president, he was going to continue to be the president, and when he died, his son was going to be the president, and when his son died, his grandson was going to be the president. And so, for people of my generation, and we were often accused of not engaging with politics, for people of my generation to be behind something as momentous as this was huge. But of course, the big euphoria and the big victory of ousting Mubarak was short-lived because in stepped the reality of politics. And the reality of politics meant the tediousness of the political process. It meant sitting in meetings, negotiating, and what soon became very clear that there was no plan after Mubarak had stepped down. So after this head of the system stepped down or was forced out or was ousted, there was no plan of what to do next. And the only, again, the only institution who was ready to take to the stage was the army, and the word SCAF became very popular and, well, very famous, and it's the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces. At that time, and that took months, and the revolutionaries, people in Tahrir Square, fell out with the military quite quickly, so they rallied people to the streets again, and at that time, I was in Cairo. I was sent by the BBC to work in, in our Cairo bureau to be part of covering the story, and it was still fresh in people's memory, the victory, the sense of victory, what people are able to achieve. So Tahrir Square at that time felt like it was the center of the world, like this is the place where change could happen. There were families there going to take, taking their kids and watching, uh, watching videos in the square, showing them pictures of those who died, and they say, this is real history, and I want my kids to be aware of this history. It just felt like there was so much momentum Fridays at that time had names. There was the Friday of Rage, of course, and this particular Friday was called Kabul Friday, and I think you can guess why. One of the major powers that came after the revolution, aside from the army and the revolutionaries, were the Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Salafis, the ultra-conservative Islamists, and they wanted to show force. They wanted to tell those in power, AKA the army, and they wanted to show the revolutionaries that they too had a presence on the street. And so one Friday, they rallied up all their supporters, bussed them all, shuttled them all from different parts of Egypt to Tahrir Square. And it just had a completely different feeling. And you could see the dynamic on the street change from those who were initially in Tahrir Square to those people. And that quote was really interesting. I was trying to get into Tahrir Square, and, <laughs> and, one, of the per and one of the people manning it said, this is for men only, sister. You have to go to the other side. And I said, listen. I'm going in. But it, it was just indicative of days to come. Um, afterwards, the army cracked down on, on 
the protesters there, and this was one of the most violent and first times that the army clashed with protesters. And I was there trying to cover the story. I went there, I remember it was Ramadan, so I went there after iftar or, or the breaking of the fast. And I was there as I, and I normally was. I was taking pictures with my mobile phone, speaking to people, and in less than 30 seconds, I was surrounded by an army general and his officers, and I was ushered in into this horrible truck. And I just realized that I was being arrested. And to this day, I really didn't know what for. It was completely random. And it's really interesting what you think about when this happens. One thing that I thought about on my way to nowhere was how angry my mother was going to be. <laughs> how the hell do I explain this to her? Why was I in Tahrir Square when she had told me time and time again it was dangerous? But also about the argument with my husband. Obviously, he's not going to be happy. And he's going to say, why did you do it? Why? And, and it, there was going to be a big argument about what happened, except I didn't really know what was going to happen to me. And it kind of dawned on me that that was the scariest part. And a, another kind of fear seeped in. And that was at a time when the army were notorious for military trials for civilians. So you'd be picked up, put in prison, and put on military trial, which could not be appealed. But also at that time, there were reports of virginity tests. So you can imagine what was on my mind at that time. I was detained for 20 hours, and luckily nothing happened to me. The BBC were very, very quick to run a story, to speak to the authorities, to fly my husband in from London to Cairo, and luckily I came out with the people who were arrested with me uh, with no harm. But to me, to this day, I think the scariest thing about it was that it was so random. A bunch of elections happened, parliamentary elections happened, and at that point we saw two sides of democracy. The democracy of the ballot box that Egyptians were trying for the first time, but the democracy of the street as well. Many revolutionaries thought, this just won't cut it. We will not concede when people have been killed, we will not concede when the military is in power, we boycott the elections. The Muslim Brotherhood, however, told their supporters to go to the ballot boxes. So you had two things happening at the same time. You had the battles in Mohammed Mahmoud Street, and this is a crucial street because it was just at the end of it was the interior ministry, so there were ba battles with the police again. And also tear gas was used very heavily at that point. So as a journalist, you're doing lives and you're sniffling all, all the time. But also part of, part of the interesting thing of being Egyptian and covering Egypt is that you get calls from family. So I remember just as, I, as I, I was about to go on air and my grandmother called me in the midst of this big clash with the police and tear gas and she was saying, are you okay? Are you eating? And I said, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine, I just need to go. She's like, why are you panting? Don't go to Tahrir Square. It's really, really bad. And I said, no, 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 I just, I need to go, Granny, love you. And at the other, at the other side of the phone was the newsroom saying, when can you come live? Are you in Tahrir Square? We need to take you now. And this duality of family asking whether I've, ate, I've eaten and the newsroom asking whether I'd be available would be the story of my life. My grandmother passed away uh, a few months ago, and one of, the very, one of the very many things that I miss about covering the story is actually getting these really misplaced calls asking if I ate. <laughs> And then a long year of Morsi, after many, many elections, the Muslim Brotherhood won a majority in parliament, but they also got to the presidency. Uh, Mohammed Morsi was the Muslim Brotherhood candidate, and needless to say, his year of presidency was extremely tumultuous. He made one bad decision after another. Many people had hoped that he was Egypt's first democratically elected president, and that they would see change, only to find that senior members of the Muslim Brotherhood were senior members of government. Well, also, that people just weren't sure where his allegiances were. Were his allegiances with the Egyptian people or were they with the Muslim Brotherhood? They took one, one bad decision after another. The economy almost collapsed. Women's rights were hit rock bottom. Lots and lots of reports about sexual harassment uh, making record numbers at that time. There were also the Copts' rights. The Christian community were really worried that they were being marginalized. And at the, after a year of his rule, people wanted to take to the streets again to oust him. And so the country was polarized at that point. Some people were saying, Mohammed Morsi is Hosni Mubarak. There was no change. And of course, the Muslim Brotherhood supporters were saying he was democratically elected. You need to give him a chance. June 30th was the anniversary of 
Mohamed Morsi's presidency, and this is when people took to the streets, at least those who opposed him, to tell him it was time to go. And then the military, of course, were back. This man on the right is Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. He was, at that time, the Minister of Defense, and he, ironically enough, was appointed by Mohamed Morsi. And he was the man who was going to tell him to step down. He came out, he announced the suspension of the Constitution, effectively ousting Mohamed Morsi. That was one part of Egypt that day, that was July 3rd, the celebrations and people saying, it's not a coup, we wanted him out. That was another part of Egypt on the same day. Muslim Brotherhood supporters saying, it is a coup, we want him back in. And the crackdown. The Muslim Brotherhood supporters went and organized a sit-in in a mosque called Rab al Mosque. It's in a, in a neighborhood that is known to be a Muslim Brotherhood stronghold area. They were there for a whole month, and at the end of that month, that was last August, the army went in and cracked down. Now, there are so many debates about who was responsible for what, but I remember going into one mosque that was used as a makeshift morgue, and there were bodies there that, was laying, that were laying around one after another, being putrefied because people just didn't have nowhere to put them. They were putting ice on the bodies because there were no morgues to take them. And most people were saying, the army did this to us. I remember there was a very surreal moment where it was the Maghrib call to prayer, or the sunset call to prayer, and people were lining up to pray next to dead bodies. And I'd reported on this story now for three years, and I'd never seen anything like it, ever. There were also reports that the Muslim Brotherhood supporters themselves were also responsible for many fatalities on the police force and also on the army, and that they too were carrying arms. To this day, the debate continues, but the number of dead, proportionately, was a lot higher on those protesters. And then, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi became the savior. He was the one who ridded people of this failure of a president, who ousted him, who also banned the Muslim Brotherhood and who designated them now as a terrorist organization. Those who opposed them and detested them felt that he was the hero and he emerged as the man of the moment. He emerged as the man who was going to take Egypt to a new beginning and hence started the CC mania. He was everywhere. He was on billboards, he was in posters, T-shirts, there was a CC perfume at that point. There was CC jewelry, CC chocolate if you fancied, and there was lots and lots of poster kissing action going on at the time. The presidential elections were about three weeks ago. I went to cover them, and Egyptians had, after three years of demonstrations, ushered another military man in power after ousting one in 2011. So, going back to the initial question, are we back to where we started? Yeah. The Egyptians took to the street, asking for bread, freedom, and social justice. None of these demands have been met. They ousted a military man, ushered an Islamist man in, and then another military man in. There was a sense of paranoia and conspiracy everywhere. There was a new anti-protesting law now that prohibits protesting without without permission. Most of the key figures of the 2011 revolution are now in prison. And of course, the struggle continues, and I couldn't do this talk without mentioning my three colleagues, Peter Gresta, Mohammed Fahmi, and Beher Mohammed. Sorry. They were sentenced to seven years in prison early this week, only for doing what we've all been doing, for doing their job, for trying to tell the story. And up until the verdict, we all had hoped that they would be acquitted. They now face, up until now, seven years uh, in prison. Obviously, we're, drawing, we're trying to do all we can to speak to the authorities, to try and release them, but I would urge you to go on Twitter and use those hashtags. And obviously, I can't, I can't continue with this talk without dedicating this to them and their families because it just shows how difficult it is to try and tell a story like Egypt, being a journalist and just doing your job on the streets of Egypt now, excuse me. Are we back where we started? No. Things have changed. 
There's a whole generation now of young people who have grown up with the revolution, who know that those in power cannot remain in power forever, and those in power can certainly not allow their kids to be in power forever. There is political dialogue on a micro level like never before. Those in power know that people are watching closely, and despite this love-in with the new president, people will want change soon. There have been many, many voices, and this is really what I want to end on, that have been hopeful and have believed in the revolution for a long time. There are so many names to mention, but I'm going to end on one that has affected me quite personally. And this is colleague and friend Bassem Sabri. Bassem was a respected writer. He was a respected political commentator. But more importantly, he was a believer in the revolution. He was a believer in change. And despite everything, he believed things will get better Bassem is no longer with us. He passed away a few months ago, and a voice and a bright, bright light of those voices believing in the revolution has left it. But he did leave us his words, and I'd like to end on them. He says, but I still have hope. It's a disease I have and from which I don't wish to be cured. It's my belief in change, in the inevitability of justice and truth, and that one day they will prevail. It is not a hollow hope. I have seen springs of will, courage, and sacrifice, of art and creativity, of diehard quests of freedom, dignity, and justice. I still have hope that one day we'll find our way. Thank you.